What a great, great honor to be here with you. And it is my privilege to articulate on, the, on behalf of all of you and all of us how grateful we are that such a thing exists as this, uh, such a ministry and such a conference. And it is an honor to be here with you. The title was assigned to me. It, it, it came in the letter, the complete title. And I was excited about it from the beginning. It's a title I, I wanted to, to sink my teeth into. It's a title I checked when I got here to make sure had not changed. <laughs> I was preaching in South Georgia years and years ago on Mother's Day. And I had been asked to, uh, to be the special guest preacher for Mother's Day in this church. Typical county seat, First Baptist Church, Mother's Day. I can do this. I, I know what this is about. Typical Southern Baptist church order of worship. The preacher's introduced, the choir sings, the preacher preaches. I'm being introduced. I'm, I'm in the zone, temporarily. The preacher gets up to introduce me and says, we've asked Dr. Muller here for this very special Sunday. He's going to speak on a Christian understanding of sex education. <laughs> Not in the letter. <laughs> Not my expectation whatsoever. But I'll tell you what, that was the quickest scrambling for a message on sex education between an introduction and a message. I just wanted that choir special to last a little while longer. <laughs> the way the world thinks meeting the natural mind in the mirror and in the marketplace. The word thinking there is so operative, it's so central. David Bevington in describing evangelicalism in a definition that's become kind of the standard boilerplate for people on both sides of the Atlantic, for academics and journalists and all the rest, has described evangelicalism in terms of four distinctives. Biblicism, a confidence that the Bible is the Word of God, Conversionism, a belief that persons must come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Crucicentrism, the belief that the cross is the central act, the cross and the resurrection whereby God saves sinners. And then activism. Evangelicals are people who do things. We, we hold crusades. We, we go on mission. We build things. We organize things. We create Bible colleges and conferences and seminaries and mission agencies and magazines and periodicals and publishing houses and all the rest. But absent from that list is thinking. And that is to our shame. For Christ's people are to be defined by the renewing of the mind. The biblical axiom is very clear, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, that there is a priority between thinking and action. And if, and if we get to that activism without adequate thinking, then we'll discover that our activism and our activity is separated from the gospel and from the demands of Christ on our lives. So without apology, we're here to think about thinking. I love the theme of this conference. Think. Of course, that's an imperative, by the way. It's a verb. But we're also just thinking about thinking, and, and that is something that is altogether rare. Children do not much think about thinking. We understand that there are developmental issues that come in, in early adolescence. All of a sudden there is the, the acknowledgement that there are other minds. People think differently than I think. People, people think differently than my parents think. There are other parents who have different thoughts. By the time we enter into adolescence, we are aware that it is possible not only to think, but to think about thinking. We, we perceive ourselves thinking and begin to think about that. But one of the sad things for most human beings, it's not unique to evangelicals, but most human beings get over any attempt to think about thinking. We ought to be the people who never get over that. Because of our understanding of, of how we were made to bring God's glory, to bring God glory and to, and to point persons to Christ and to exult in the things of Christ, to meditate upon His Word, because of the imperative that we demonstrate what it means to be a living sacrifice through the renewing of our minds. We're the people who have to perpetually think about thinking. That's what the philosophers call a second-order discipline. Thinking is a first-order discipline. But thinking about thinking is a second-order discipline. It's, it's complex thinking. It's, it's the kind of thinking that is required if we're going to measure 
faithful thinking over against unfaithful thinking. The recognition of difference is what leads to the first steps in thinking about thinking. The realization that we could think in other ways than we think. The recognition that there are other peoples, there are other worldviews, there are other philosophies of life, there are other belief systems in which people believe and think differently than we think. We need to understand that this is an essential part of our Christian faithfulness, the recognition of difference. We, as Christians, must recognize that there is a crucial distinction between the regenerate mind and the unregenerate mind. Those of us who have come to know salvation through Jesus Christ, who have been, by God's grace, united with Christ, those who, in seeking to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, understand the difference between the before and after, we come to understand that there once was a way we thought that we can no longer think. A part of our growth into Christ is a growth that is an intellectual growth from ways and patterns of thinking, beliefs and principles of thought and axioms that we must leave behind in order to be faithful to Christ. But our faithfulness is just part of the equation. The other part of the equation of our urgency is understanding the mind of the age, the mind of those around us, because we desperately want to communicate the gospel to them. And very much like entering into any culture, even entering into our own culture requires us to step back and think carefully about how people think. The operational rules and principles and worldviews that establish the prevailing thought system around us. Now, we're facing something of an intellectual crisis in the Western world. It's interesting that as we are here at this conference, it's in the midst of a generalized period in the history of Western civilization where there are significant shifts taking place in the way people think. There are different periods of thought. We tend now to recognize a conversation about pre-modern ways of thinking and modern ways of thinking and post-modern ways of thinking. We are aware of the fact that even in our lifetimes and in this room, whether they be short or long, given the pace of change in our age, anyone here who has the slightest intellectual perception can detect there are significant shifts going on in the worldview around us that prevails. We're facing something of a knowledge emergency. There are going to be people around us who aren't really certain right now that it's possible actually to know anything. There are a, a good number of persons in certain sectors of our society who hear the uh, claim to knowledge as a political statement. Or they're unable almost to make in any kind of sensical uh, understanding a differentiation between fact and value or between fact and preference. This knowledge emergency isn't quite so new as we might imagine. It goes all the way back to the Enlightenment. We recognize there was this giant shift in the way that human beings thought. It didn't so much affect the cobblers of the time as much as it did the, the clergy and the academics, but given the way that societies work and cultures are shaped, before long, the cobbler and the cobbler's children were affected by the very same forms of thought that had shaped the elites of that society. We're now in something like a postmodern crisis. And even though that word is overused, it's still rather inescapable. It's unavoidable because we have to have something to talk about what happened. We understand the shift from the pre-modern way of thinking into modernity and the rise of modern science and all that that brought with it, the regime of reason. But we also understand that we're not there anymore. At least we're not there fully anymore. We need some biblical grounding. I want to suggest that there are many places in Scripture to which we could look. But my heart was drawn particularly to the first chapter of the book of Romans, and I would ask for you to turn there with me. Romans chapter 1. Begin reading at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world." 
in the things that have been made. So they're not without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now this is God's Word. Here in the context of the opening chapters of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul is informing not only the Roman congregation of Christians in the first century, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Christians throughout all the ages, that this is our story. It's the story of universal human sinfulness and human depravity, of, of the guilt that is ours because of our sin, and the explanation of how it is that we find ourselves here. Now, Romans chapter 1 is fascinating territory. It, it's territory in terms of a text where many evangelicals are now scrambling to go in order to make sure we know what the Bible teaches on unavoidable issues of sinfulness. And we should be very, very thankful that our Lord loves us so much as to be so specific. But what many evangelicals neglect are the verses that precede. Beginning in verse 18, the Apostle Paul tells us about the great epistemological crisis, the great intellectual crisis, the great knowledge crisis. It is not as new as we might think in our modern conceit. It's really old. It's as old as is described here in terms of the experience of humanity. Paul has told the Romans he's not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The Apostle Paul here is going to be talking about human depravity, human sinfulness. He's going to speak of it not only in terms of how it works its way out, but he's going to speak of it in terms of, of where it emerges where it resides in, in the mind before it, it bursts forth in activity. But he does so armed with a confidence he's already announcing to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 18, he tells us that the wrath of God is being revealed even in the gospel. From heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. This is something we desperately need to know. Paul tells us that sinful humanity is involved in a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy of the few, it's a conspiracy of the many. The many meaning every single human being who is of Adam, all of us. There is an intellectual activity that is described here that is at the very heart of human sinfulness. We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. One of the key insights from this chapter is that as human beings in our sinfulness, in our arrogance, in our pridefulness, in our disobedience and in our rebellion, suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We, we gain an essential understanding of the human being here. We desperately need to know we are suppressors of truth. 
And we don't like to be told that about ourselves. We name ourselves Homo sapiens, the wise thinking creature. We think of ourselves as set apart from the, the rest of creation because we have this intellectual capacity, and, and so we do. We like to think of ourselves as, as fair-minded people. We, we would like to think that we think rightly because, after all, we're the one doing the thinking. We tend to hang around with like-minded people who think as we think. Nothing so reinforces the way we think as being with people who think we think rightly because they think with us. But the Apostle Paul says the human beings, in terms of our intellectual bent, in terms of our great intellectual ambition, in terms of the way we actually operate, the, the way it turns out is that we use this intellect in order to suppress the truth. And we're surrounded by people who think their great ambition is to find the truth. We, we are living in an age of post-enlightenment science and the great regime of the of the disciplines and the, the liberal arts, and we're living in a, an age of massive universities and upward educational mobility, and we like to think it's all about a quest for truth. We put truth on the, the seal of our great universities, Veritas. But the reality is, the Apostle Paul says, we actually are about the project of suppressing the truth. And then he goes on further and, and tells us that we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We not only entertain and enjoy those things that are not true, we not only suppress the truth because we do not want to deal with it, we are not only truth deniers, we, we, we work out that suppression conspiracy in a great cloud of unrighteousness. And of course, derivative of that is all the rationalization and the theorizing and, and self-justification that comes but Paul cannot be more clear here. And we're accountable. This is something we, we desperately need to know about ourselves. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. So this knowledge crisis is not what people do not know. The real knowledge crisis is what we will not know. It's a disposition of the will. The Bible is very clear about something that some modern schools of philosophy are just now catching on to. The will is the great engine of the intellect. The conceit of the modern age was that the intellect was neutral, as human beings were basically good, or at least morally neutral, and that the great enemy was ignorance. The answer was enlightenment. Well, it turns out we don't actually want enlightenment. It turns out that the will drives the intellect, and the Apostle Paul here, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us that the knowledge crisis, the intellectual emergency, is not what we do not know, it's what we will not know. And the background to this is the understanding of the Mago Dei, what it means to be made the image of God. The Scripture is clear in telling us about what we as theologians call general revelation or natural revelation. Paul in the very next verse will point to the fact that embedded in creation is the knowledge of God. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. How? For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. You know, even His invisible attributes are made visible in creation. No one is going to be able to say, I didn't know. No one is going to have an excuse. It's not just in the outer world of nature that we apprehend, it's also in the inner world of the conscience. Paul, in the next chapter, will deal with the reality of the conscience. The problem with the conscience is not that it's there for which we should be thankful, but that our will will not allow the conscience to operate as it was intended. Because we can make our conscience do what we want our conscience to do. But the fact that we have a conscience is reflective of the fact that we are made in the image of God. This does set us apart from creation. This does 
make us distinct from the other creatures. We love to see these great animal shows on television. When I was growing up, it was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. <laughs> and they would show these most bizarre and wonderful animals. And being a young boy, the thing I loved to see was the tiger or the lion. Over here is a... I'm not sure what you call them. Someone here is going to correct me, whatever I say. I know it's not a flock of antelope, it's a herd of antelope or a gaggle of antelope, but whatever they are, there they are unsuspecting, and there's the lion in the grass. And the lion leaps out with an energy that's almost unbelievable. And it gets one of these antelope and it kills it. I never saw one of those lions step back and go, wow, I don't know what's in me sometimes. That was violent. <laughs> I, there, there has to be some way of meeting my needs other than this. <laughs> I need therapy. <laughs> no, he, he just eats. There, there, there's no conscience whatsoever. You've never walked in your house and been met by the dog who walks up and says, <laughs> first of all, apologies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. But as soon as you're parents, you come to understand that when you can't find the two-year-old, it's because he knows he's done something. And he's not behind the recliner playing hide-go-seek. But we can make the conscience do what we want it to do. We can rationalize. The Apostle Paul here is so clear about how sin affects the way we think. It, he, he indicts us as being co-conspirators in this process of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And then he tells us that the knowledge crisis is not that we do not know, it's that we will not know without excuse. And then he tells us how this works out. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, nor give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking. There it is. Futility in thinking, emptiness in thinking, vacuity in thinking, self-delusion in thinking, rationalizers in thinking. The futility is the word here that represents such intellectual emptiness. How does that work out? Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Now, there's something we don't want to hear. All around us are monuments to human wisdom. You go in the bookstore and you find monuments to human wisdom. You, you go to the university and it's all about the triumphs of human wisdom. And yet the great verdict of God on all of our intellectual pretension is fool. And then, of course, this leads to idolatry. In exchange, the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. But that's not the end. Three times in the verses that follow, you will find the formula, God gave them up or God gave them over. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity. For, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a, what? Debased mind, according to verse 28 to do what ought not to be done. One of the things I hope you will note as you look at this passage is that taken, as Paul tells us, well, this is not the way we hear it so often from evangelical pulpits. What we hear is a warning. Look what happened to Rome. God gave Rome over. Look, look what happened to empire after empire. God gave it over. And the warning comes now to the United States of America. If we follow such lines of, of sinful descent, then God will give us over too. That has nothing to do with this passage. This is not about empires, Roman or American. This is about humanity. Humanity. 
The tense is past. This has already happened. God gave humanity over. And the Apostle Paul here includes us all in this indictment. So where did it happen? Well, Genesis 3. We'll look back to the fall when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate of the tree of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, there's the knowledge crisis. Well, there's the intellectual crisis. It began with Adam and Eve demanding to know what they were not to know. And once they knew it, well, they knew themselves as rebels, which they now were, as the enemies of God, as they had now declared themselves. This is the fall. And just in quick theological summary, in terms of the biblical context, we have to understand that the story is grounded here. Our story is grounded here. We don't know who we are without this. And it's not just about who we are. This is the universal story of humanity. In Adam, we all fell. This great knowledge crisis, this great epistemological crisis, which is the word for knowledge, this great intellectual crisis, it all goes back to the fall. And since the fall, the consequences of the fall on our thinking have been nothing less than infinitely devastating. One of the problems is that this is not readily apparent to us. We are now so distanced from the true knowledge of ourselves that we do not even know how warped our thinking is. The consequences of the fall were enormous and immediate. First, death, separation and alienation from God, eternal punishment, cosmic consequences that are made clear in the totality of Scripture. Then there is the entire story of human sinfulness and depravity, the descent into utter sinfulness, which is made clear even in the early chapters of the book of Genesis, because you go so quickly from the fall in Genesis 3 and God's verdict upon human sinfulness. To Noah, Babel, and all the rest. Now, theologically, we refer to this as the noetic consequences of sin, or the noetic consequences of the fall. And you're going to leave here knowing the word noetic. N O E T I C M O U S E. Noetic <laughs> refers to knowledge. There are intellectual consequences of sin, intellectual consequences of the fall. We face these head on. John Calvin said that there were three great causes of this noetic disaster, this knowledge disaster. And the first was the fall itself, the direct results of the fall. Adam and Eve had an intellectual crisis the very moment they sinned. And the book of Genesis is very clear and candid in pointing us to their shame and to their knowledge, fig leaves and all. Secondly, Calvin pointed out that the church must never be unaware of the fact that Satan wishes to confuse our thinking. We have an intellectual enemy. And this intellectual enemy is ignored to our peril. But third, Calvin said, we must recognize that God, for the protection of his own character, judges our minds in such a way that he gives us over to ignorance and falsehood seem most crucially and centrally, as Paul tells us in Romans 1, in idolatry. Now, what are the effects? What are the noetic, what are this, the effects of, of sin and the fall upon our intellect? Well, the first is that our reason is now opposed to God. Now, here's where there's a very interesting conversation to be had between the Reformers and the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church believes in original sin. The Roman Catholic Church believes in multiple effects of the fall. But the Roman Catholic Church does not believe that our reason was in any way fatally impaired by the fall. Instead, the Roman Catholic Church from the medieval period until the present suggests that the main effect of the fall was upon our senses, not upon our reason. And so sensuality, the Roman Catholic Church says, is the way into which most persons find themselves as sinners. But the Reformers came along and said, no, absolutely, 
that ignores the very fact that the central issue we have with the Roman church is intellectual. We, we believe that its, its claim to knowledge is a false claim. And we believe that the Bible speaks clearly to the fact that there is an intellectual fall. There is now a capacity of reason that God put within as human creatures that is corrupted such that, and here's where the reformers step in, back where we were just a few moments ago, the will now warps the intellect. The will, fallen, now produces a fallen reason. Now, the Reformers didn't say that the reason was completely obliterated any more than they said in the fall, the image of God, the Imago Dei, was completely obliterated. Of course it's not. If it were completely obliterated, we wouldn't be able to have any kind of life. We wouldn't have any kind of ordered civilization. The Reformers were honest enough to say, look, we're getting a whole lot of good data from fallen people. Right? Right? Calvin went so far as to say the heathens give us most of the sciences. We don't believe that our unregenerate neighbors know nothing. In fact, we've all been taught by unregenerate people. So the reason is not, their reason is not obliterated, it's not completely destroyed. They are not irrational. Instead, they are rationally given over to sin. Looking at the Scripture, we are with the Reformers drawn to make a distinction insofar as it's possible in our minds between a natural knowledge and a supernatural knowledge. And it's very much true that an unregenerate person can know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. An unregenerate person can find a cure to a disease. An unregenerate person can design a, a magnificent structure. An unregenerate person can, can come up with a technology that literally changes the world. But when it comes to the most important issues of life and meaning, when we actually find out who we are and ask those most basic questions of, of God, that is where our reason is most corrupted. And that's where leaning on Romans chapter 1, the Reformers would remind us that the unregenerate mind can never reason its way to salvation. It will never, the Apostle Paul says, reason its way to the cross. The cross is foolishness to Greeks. There's no way that we can find salvation in our intellect because it is devastatingly fallen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we read, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The unregenerate mind cannot understand regenerate things. It's a category problem. It's not an educational problem. No amount of education as education can solve this problem. No, matter of, no, no manner of communication or, or illumination or seminars or classes or studies or degrees will, will lead one to salvation. The reason is opposed to God. The unregenerate mind sees the gospel as foolishness and as, as folly. The Apostle Paul himself was dismissed as an idle babbler. Here again, it's the link between willing and knowing. The unregenerate mind can know many things, but the most important thing the unregenerate mind cannot know, or more precisely, will not know. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The noetic effects of the fall are multiple, and they are inexhaustible. But just to put some before our minds in terms of our understanding of how this noetic fall works its way out, think in terms of such things as ignorance. Had there been no fall, there would have been no ignorance. These things, as Paul said, the, even the things of God, even His invisible attributes are clearly seen in creation. So ignorance would have been impossible until the fall where it is now axiomatic. Distractedness. Every single human being has attention deficit disorder. That's us. We are so easily distracted. Forgetfulness. We have all committed to memory things that we have now forgotten. This would have been impossible had we not sinned. Prejudice. Intellectual prejudice is one of our besetting problems. We all have intellectual prejudices, and one of the one of the great achievements of the postmodern mindset has been to, 
force an honest discussion of these intellectual prejudices. If there is a gain from postmodernism, as it left behind modernism, at least a part of that gain was the recognition that we need an honest confession of our intellectual prejudices. The problem is that we do not know ourselves well enough to know our intellectual prejudices because we're prejudiced to even think about our prejudices. Faulty perspective. We all have a perspectival take on reality. That's just necessary. We are finite persons. But had we not sinned, we would all share the right and accurate perspective on these things. But as it is, we are now shaped by all kinds of cultural and linguistic and tribal and ethnic and historical and individual and familial and, frankly, the list could go on, blinders such that we do not see things as others see them, even though we assume that others must see things if they were right-minded as, as we see them. Aristotle understood this. He told the famous parable of the fish. He said, if you want to know what being wet is like, do not ask a fish. He doesn't know he's wet. Intellectual fatigue. Some of you are showing early signs. <laughs> Plug in. Inconsistencies. It would be bad enough if we were plagued with inconsistencies. The problem is we don't even see them. And they're more readily detected by others. Failure to draw the right conclusion. This is a besetting intellectual sin. There are persons who will say A, B, C, D, E, Z. They, they just don't, don't even recognize that they are drawing the wrong conclusions. There's the willful denial of data. There's a willful blindness. Again, going back to the fact that the will drives the intellect. It is the will that corrupts the reason. Intellectual apathy. Besetting intellectual sin. If we did not bear these noetic effects of the fall, we would be infinitely passionate about the things that should be of our infinite concern. Our intellectual apathy, which works its way out in every dimension of our lives, is one of the most devastating effects of the fall. Dogmatism and closed-mindedness. I know some of you have that problem. We hold to things that we shouldn't hold to with such tenacity. Because it turns out that the human brain, the, the intellect, seizes upon certain things as comfort food. And they're taken away from us, even if driven by reason and data, over great resistance. Intellectual pride. Intellectual pride leads us, as I just did, to say, some of you have this problem. Intellectual pride is, well, it's seen in the fact that Scripture tells us that knowledge puffs up. And one of the dangers that we face, that we, we need to acknowledge openly, is that higher education actually becomes not only a stewardship, but it becomes, we must acknowledge, a tremendous minefield spiritually because of the besetting sin of human pride that comes to us with human achievement. And intellectual achievements are some of the most prized trophies. Vain imagination. Well, here it is, right in Romans chapter 1. Vain imagination. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit here, tells us, you want to look what vain imagination looks like? This is how Romans 1... How, this is how it functions. The, the list of sins and, and the direct references to homosexuality, for instance, are ways of illustrating human sinfulness. It's not to single out human sins and say, look, that's what sinners look like. It is to point out certain sins and say, that's what our sin looks like. That's what human sinfulness looks like. It takes enormous defiance of the will to get to that. But the point of Romans 1 is not just that those people who commit those sins are guilty in that way. It is that we are all guilty in that same way. And we're all in that catalog of sins. But the vain imagination becomes so pinpointedly indicted in Romans chapter 1 because we will make images of God out of created things, even reptiles. Vain imagination is one of the great besetting sins 
that comes to us in the noetic effects of the fall. Intellectual mental lethargy, vain imagination, miscommunication. There's another intellectual problem. Translation is difficult. This is on the other side, not only of Genesis 3, but of Babel. Miscommunication is a horrible problem. It is one of the great limitations upon intellectual advance. Of course, it turns out that that, remember Calvin's third thing, God's judgment upon us, some of these noetic effects are because God said, I'm not going to let you know that. Go back and read the Babel story and you'll understand why this uh, issue of miscommunication is not an accident. Partial knowledge. We, we know in part. We, we sometimes, even more devastatingly, don't know how partial our knowledge is. The list could go on, but the point is that all of this is tied to the will. And we come to under, understand that this intellectual disaster that has happened to us, this, this complex that we call the noetic effects of the fall, come down not only to just what we might try to isolate as our intellectual activities, but our intellectual activities work their way out in other aspects of our lives, including such things as our emotions and our intuitions. Because it turns out that the way human knowledge works in, in terms of a biblical psychology is it, not just that we always have operational reason thinking about who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it and where we are and why it matters. We operate the only way a sane person can operate a good deal of our life on what might be called an intellectual autopilot. As our emotions and intuitions are actually shaped by our intellect, which is shaped by our will in such a way that we find ourselves not always thinking in an openly rational, self-conscious way, but nonetheless driven by thinking that is working its way out in intuitions and emotions. The noetic effects of the fall are devastating. That's why we have to think about thinking. That's why our Christian discipleship is also an intellectual activity we need to understand. We, we, we must come to terms with the fact that the noetic effects of the fall operate on multiple levels. We're concerned about this because we want to understand ourselves. And as we shall see, the only way we can understand ourselves is to be told who we are and to be told what our problem is. But we desperately need to know. But there's a second reason we must be concerned about this, and thus this kind of thinking about thinking is necessary, and that is because we want to understand the natural mind. We want to understand the unregenerate mind around us because of a concern for reaching persons with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So mission and evangelism, indeed love of God and love of neighbor, compels us to seek to understand this. Moving into issues that I hope will be of immediate helpfulness to us, I just want to remind you of something you already know. Evangelicals over the last 30 to 40 years have begun using a word that I had to borrow from the Germans, worldview. Because we understand that the only way that cognizant, aware human beings can operate is in a complex of thought that doesn't require us to rethink everything all at once, all the time. And so we operate out of a worldview, which is a set of beliefs and principles and axioms of thought that allow the world to make sense and allow us to make our way sensibly within it. And sociologists refer to such things as, as plausibility structures. We, we inhabit a certain world that makes sense to us because we have certain habits of the mind that make the world plausible. I dare say very few of you this morning got up and asked yourself before you got out of bed if you still believe in gravity. It, it's, it's just a part of your world picture. It's a, it's a part of what you understand. That you didn't worry that you were going to fall up out of bed. That, that's something you don't think about. If you had to think about that all the time, we would be immobilized. Most of you probably did not wake up this morning in a deep existential crisis about whether you do or do not exist. There are a couple of people who are still in their hotel rooms this morning because maybe they did. It, it will come to most human beings at some time, but, but not every day. That, that's not the way we operate. We, we operate on the basic assumption that we exist. 
We operate in a, a basic set of moral assumptions about what the good life is and what we're called to do and what is right and what is wrong. We, we operate out of a certain sense of rationality and, and we operate as economic people, as, as, as political citizens. We, we operate as neighbors and sons and daughters and husbands and wives on the basis of the fact that we can, we can operate because we take certain things for granted. The problem, and this is why evangelicals have begun to talk about this over the last couple of generations, is that we understand that these worldviews show all the marks of human sinfulness, just as every human culture and, and civilization and soul does. But the plausibility structures are really important. They're, they're absolutely basic. We understand there have been some tremendous changes in these plausibility structures over the course of what we define as Western civilization. This, this periodization from modern to, or for even from pre-modern to modern, and then from modern to postmodern, well, it reflects some shifts that really have taken place. Very quickly, in understanding the, the natural mind, I want to speak specifically about the natural mind that we are most likely to meet and to meet in this culture. It's a secular mind. Now, that's one of those words you have to use, but you have to use carefully. Because when you say it's a secular mind, it's not a fully secularized mind. The, the whole idea of secularization was this. The, the, those prophets of the modern age felt that as human beings gain control over the great forces of nature, as we dam up dams and turn it into hydroelectricity, as we, as we split the atom, as we come to know more and more, as the great mysteries give way to knowledge given to us by science and, and to power and the power of human manipulation by industry, we, we will have less need for God. And so the great prophets of secularization back in the late 18th century and into the 19th century and certainly coming to full bloom in the 20th century they said what's going to happen in, in, in the West, in Western nations, is that people are going to become fully secularized. It didn't happen. Even someone like Peter Berger, the, the great prophet of the secularization theory, a pr prominent sociologist of religion, he, he came just a few years ago to write an article, Secularization Falsified, because he said it, it didn't happen, uh, except where it did. It turned out that in Western Europe it pretty much happened by the book. Estimates are right now that only between 3 and 4 percent of most persons in Belgium and the Netherlands and France and many other countries actually attend church on any kind of regular basis. So these great cathedrals are out there, but the space and the, the, the worldview, the mind has been almost fully secularized. So it turned out there was a geographical distinction, whereas in North America, fully 80 to 90 percent of Americans say they believe in God, and, and at least 70 percent of Americans darken the door of some church over the process of a year, and 55 percent of Americans say they go to church virtually every week, at least three out of four weeks. That's, that's an American distinction over against Europe. But then the sociologists come back and say, but you know, it's not only geographically distinct, it's distinct by class. And this is something important for you to know, especially as you're involved in higher education. Because it turns out that in America, the secularization thesis worked its way out primarily by the book in higher education, in, in the dominant class that teaches in faculties. The, the most secularized sec cohort of the American population is, is those who have tenure in American universities. It turns out that the cultural creatives, especially those who are now involved in the arts and the media, tend to be far more secular than the others. And the, the ruling elites, to use the sociological categories, tend to be pervasively secularized. Peter Berger was talking about the fact they did this longitudinal study, that, that's a, this huge research project, uh, to find out which cultures were most and least religious. And, and religious here just means religious, okay? What they discovered is that the least religious people in the world were Swedes. I know I'm in Minneapolis. Nice Swedes, but very secular Swedes. And it turned out that the most religious people in the world were Indians. And that is in the nation of India. And then Peter Berger saying, if you want to understand America, you need to understand America as a nation of Indians ruled over by an elite of Swedes. It's going to hit some of you about dinner. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's the way that, that that works. So when we're actually talking to people today, we talk about secularism. In certain sectors of the society, there is something of a secular mind. But the thing we have to understand is that the secular mind is not an unreligious mind. It may be irreligious, but it is not unreligious. There's some object of ultimate fidelity and concern. To understand that the modern mind, we speak of it very quickly in, in five precepts. First is postmodern anti-realism. Now, I know you're writing this down because there's going to be a test. 
postmodern anti realism There are people in our society who aren't sure that, that, that what we're talking about is even real. That they would argue that a lot of what we're talking about in terms of right and wrong and all the rest is merely a game, a language game, a morality game. Now, you'll say, well, most of the people I know don't, don't believe that in any hardline sense. That's true. But that is filtered down such that the second issue here is moral relativism. Most Americans you'll meet today, in terms of the natural mind, are moral relativists selectively. They're not moral relativists in terms of hardcore postmodernists. They're moral relativists in terms of issues that tend to be growing. A recent study came out Monday, came out this week, suggesting that the moral issue on which there's been the greatest change in America in the last 40 years is premarital sex, in which the graph has been in a period of 40 years turned absolutely upside down. From 1970 to 2010, it's been a switch of about 80-20 to where it was once 80-20, the premarital sex was wrong, now it's about 80-20 the other way around. And what accounts for that kind of shift? Well, that isn't going to happen where the worldview suggests that things are objectively right and wrong. Third, there's thera therapeutic universalism. We live in a time in which the natural mind, in terms of the clothing it puts on, has adopted this therapeutic worldview that, quite frankly, tells us that the motto is basically this, you're either in therapy or you're in denial. But the idea is that the most basic problems we have will be solved if they are to be solved by therapy. The fourth is radical pluralism. Now, pluralism on the one hand is just a fact. There are people with plural worldviews around this, but it is also an ideology suggesting that that means that there is no one worldview that can be correct. And the fifth is managerial pragmatism. We, we are living in the midst of people who genuinely believe that most problems can be managed. That their goal is not so much to solve problems but in a procedural democracy to manage them. Now, very quickly, I want to give you something I think will be helpful. The unregenerate mind is the unregenerate mind. The, the natural mind is the natural mind. It, it, it doesn't change from Genesis 3 till Jesus comes. But it puts on different clothing. Charles Taylor, a Canadian philosopher, has given us something. It's a massive book, The Secular Age. You, 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 you don't need to go read the book this afternoon. I say, as if there's any threat, you're going to read that book this afternoon. <laughs> but he, he gives us something in there that's really helpful. He says that there have been in Western civilization and in the world we know three operating conditions of belief. And if that sounds big and abstract, I think you'll find it to be very, very helpful. He said there once was a time when it was impossible not to believe in God. There once was a time in which it was literally impossible not to believe. Do you know that the word atheist didn't exist in the English language until the time of Queen Elizabeth? There wasn't even a word for it, because atheism was not an accessible, it wasn't an available category. The only way you could explain how the world worked was with a reference to God. And so you might argue about which God was God or whose God was right, but you didn't argue about whether there was a God, not, not when it was impossible not to believe. And then he talks about the modern era with the Enlightenment, the rise of modern science and all the rest, and he says that there arose a second condition of belief which was possible not to believe. So you go from impossible not to believe, to all of a sudden now possible not to believe. But then he says, we have entered a time in the present. We don't know where the dividing line was. It may have been in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. Wherefore, at least some people, and especially those in the elites of society, for which the third condition of belief is impossible to believe. So as we're about our everyday task as we're engaged in the worlds in which the Lord has put us, when we're in the world of higher education, we're going to run up against a good number of people for whom belief in God seems to them to be impossible. That's one mark of the current dress of the natural mind. But for most people we're going to meet who are not teaching the classes but taking the classes, they're still stuck in that possible not to believe, possible to believe. Let me suggest to you the natural mind in its current dress in terms of several precepts that seem to be very important to understanding this mind. I'm going to have to go through them very quickly. There are 12. I'm just going to list them. The contemporary dress of the natural mind includes such features as this. Number one, I am who I think I am. 
I, I define who I am. I know who I am. I have the power to look in the mirror, look within myself, and figure out who I am. And if I change my thinking about who I am, I will change who I am. That's why you have people who are changing. It's, it's, it's the protean personality, the psychologists go, who, who put on different, they're, they're a different person now than they were two years ago. But I know who I am. I get to say who I am. Secondly, I may do some bad things, but I am not a bad person. The contemporary dress of the of the natural mind is, is not moral relativism in a hardline sense. It's, it's a moral relativism that means I'm relatively more moral than the people around me. I may do some bad things, but I'm not a bad person. I read an article by a business professor the other day who caught some students cheating, and every single one of them he said, said, I know it's a bad thing, but I, this is not me. <laughs> and he said, yes it is, evidently. Uh, you're the one who did it. Third, something is wrong, but it's not my fault. Just about everyone knows that something's wrong with her life, his life. They, they're aware of this. They, they're aware that they have a need, but they, they think whatever it is that they need, well, however it happened, it's not their fault. That leads to the fourth, something happened to me. And, and this is where the natural mind, in its modern dress, and its contemporary dress, is looking for the new book or the new seminar to explain what happened. And, and we provide that. The new diagnostic and statistical manual of the psychiatric and psychological professions is being put together now. It's one of the most controversial things you could read about in the media in the psychological world. And it's because by the time it's finished, everybody's going to be in there. We're all sick. <laughs> Fifth, morality is a good idea, but it's relatively relative. Have you ever noticed that, you just listen to the cultural conversation, we are absolutely certain, that this, that just to take mass, mass culture as we know it, we're absolutely certain that some things are wrong, but we're not so certain other things are wrong. You notice how that list changes so much and now so fast? For instance, in almost any setting, you could have talked about prostitution as being wrong even very recently, but now the province of Ontario, just up to the north, had just, just legalized prostitution and sex trafficking this week. And they did so because they said they wanted to make it safer. There's a certain logic to that. If you enter inside that worldview, there's a certain logic to that. Sixth, what goes around comes around. This is American karma. Not, it's not the hardline Confucian kind of karma. This is just the, the sense that eventually people get what they ask for. Seventh, and this is very important, there is not only one way of anything. Period. Eight, more theologically, God is available as an explanation when needed. When, when you don't have an answer, well, God. Similarly, number nine, God is available as a helper in case of emergency. This is what one, one person looking at the modern mind says is the break glass in case of emergency God. Tenth, science or technology will solve most big problems. That is, the genuine belief, and you could put modern medicine into that, and modern psychiatry, and all the rest. The genuine belief of most of the people who are our friends and neighbors is that this is the way it works. Eleventh, I may need help, but I can negotiate the terms. Twelfth, most people are well-intended, but some people are just mean. That's the way you deal with it. Now, here's what's really interesting. Christian Smith, who was at the University of North Carolina, is now at the University of Notre Dame, and his associates did this massive survey, and they came down to interview so many people, well over 3,000 people in terms of what they believe, and they came down to define the basic faith of America at this point as what they called moralistic therapeutic deism. The belief of most people that God basically wants us to be good, don't define that too carefully, and, and, and to feel good about ourselves and to be kind of healthy and whole. Don't define that too tightly. And, and they're deists. They believe there's a God, but he's not a God who is intimately involved in their lives, not a God who rules over the universe, but, the, but he's nonetheless a God that is a very important cultural referent, and somewhere back there they know it's at some point an important question. There's so much more I'd wish to say about that because I think it's the most, most accurate indictment of of the American mind, the, the, the cultural dress, the, the unregenerate mind, the natural mind is wearing at the present. But I want to tell you the punchline is this. 
the people he was surveying were not mass Americans in secular culture. They were adolescents and young adults in our churches. That's where the in the marketplace comes home to in the mirror. Folks, we've got to think about thinking because if we are not intellectual disciples of Jesus Christ, then we will find the natural mind staring us in the face. It is so close to us. It is so accessible to us. It is so easy as a, an intellectual temptation in terms of our own intuitions and reflexes. Put under intellectual pressure, it's very easy for those of us who are Christ to continue to cling to what we know to be inconsistent with the gospel. That's why if we're going to think the way Christians must think, we must, number one, avail ourselves constantly of the Word of God. Secondly, we must avail ourselves constantly of the life of the local church. And third, we must depend constantly upon the corrective of the Holy Spirit present in our lives to conform us to the image of Christ by Scripture. Because at the end of the day, we are not smarter than the rest. We are not morally superior to those who do not know Christ. We did not come to know salvation in Christ because we are wise, but because it's all of grace. Our intellectual discipleship is to be demonstrated in the renewing of our minds. And we're the people who know the renewing of our minds is going to be by word and spirit in the church. Keep thinking till Jesus comes. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for your word that chastens us to know that this is our story and it is only by grace that we are not still here left as ignorant, confused, natural-minded idolaters. Father, we thank you inexpressibly for the salvation that is ours in Christ by your act for your glory. Father, we pray not only for ourselves, but for, for your people wherever they are found, that we will be thinking, found thinking, living and dying thinking to your glory. Father, there is no capacity in us that that should happen. But we pray you'll do it in your people for your glory, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.